thousand songs. And it goes right in my pocket. Failure of the future has to be a nation that is agile, that is innovative, that is creative. In our best talent. Welcome to Future Square, the podcast all about innovation in the enterprise, brought to you and run by Collective Campus, an innovation hub based in Australia that works with companies to help them adopt the mindset, methodologies, and tools to successfully explore new business models and disruptive innovation in an era of rapid change. For more information, go to www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared, everyone. Today I'll be speaking with Arun Sundararajan. He is a professor at New York University and an affiliated faculty member at NYU's Center for Urban Science and Progress and at NYU's Center for Data Science. Professor Sundararajan's research program studies how digital technologies transform business and society. His current scholarly research focuses on peer-to-peer markets, the sharing economy, digital trust, social media and brand, digital labor, new institutions, regulation, social networks, and online privacy. He's published over 50 scientific papers in peer-reviewed academic journals and conferences and has given more than 200 invited talks at industry, government, and academic forums internationally. His research has been recognized by six Best Paper Awards, two Google Faculty Awards, and a variety of other grants. He has served on numerous editorial boards for scholarly journals. He has provided expert input about the digital economy as part of congressional testimony and to a variety of city, state, and federal government agencies, including the Presidential Council of Advisors on science and technology, the National Economic Council, the Federal Reserve Bank, the White House, and the Federal Trade Commission. His op-eds and expert commentary have appeared in Time Magazine, The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, Le Monde, El Pay, Wired, TechCrunch, The Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times, and Harvard Business Review, and a variety of radio shows and TV programs. He has served as director of NYU Stern's IS doctoral program since 27. He's one of the founders of the Workshop on Information in Networks. He's a member of the City of New York's Technology Advisory Group and is an advisor to Cisco Systems, WeShare, the Center for Global Enterprise, and the National League of Cities. Professor Sundararajan's new book, The Sharing Economy, is all about crowd-based capitalism, and it will form the focus of today's talk. So with that, it gives me much pleasure to bring to you the one, the only, Arun Sundararajan. Welcome to the show, Arun. Um, Great to be here, Steve. No, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the program, and you're joining us all the way from Manhattan, New York. Absolutely, yeah. It's um, starting to become summer here, finally. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I've only ever been to uh, New York during the summer, so I can't vouch for what it's like during the winter. Well, it's uh, very different. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine. How long have you um, called New York home? Um, More than 15 years. Um, I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, it's It's a really easy place to get used to. Yeah. Yeah, and you don't mind the hustle and bustle of the big city? Oh, no, I thrive on it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I think you have two types of people in the world, people that prefer the yep. quiet spaces and people that just love the hustle and bustle of a town like uh, New York City. Um, so thanks for coming onto the program today. We um, wanted to explore, uh, I suppose, the sharing economy. And you've recently published a book called The Sharing Economy, The End of Employment and the Rise of Crowd-Based Capitalism. Firstly, congratulations on, on the release of the book. Thank you. Yes, it's, um, it's wonderful to see it out. Mm, and I, as I understand, only the uh, Kindle version's out at the moment, but the actual physical version doesn't come out till June? Yes, um, June 14th. It should be at bookstores in the United States. And, um, you know, um, I think over the course of July and August, it will be available in other countries as well. Mm-hmm. But um, the Kindle version is available right now. Fantastic. I'm sure we'll, we'll definitely include that in the show notes for our audience. So um, I guess we wanted to talk about the sharing economy. I mean, over the past decade, we've seen the proliferation of platforms change the way many people get around, find a place to stay, get things done. Um, I know you've mentioned companies like, obviously, Airbnb, Lyft, Uber, Etsy, TaskRabbit, Upwork. Um, here in Australia, we've got companies like Airtasker, um, Go get open shed and numerous others. I mean, ultimately, these guys are all democratizing access to everything from residential lodging, automobiles, office space, power tools, people, and and even things like property investment now with um, equity, crowd-based, um, 
fundraising platforms like Fundrise in the United States and locally here in Australia, we've got Estate Baron. Um, and I guess a lot of industry incumbents are starting to feel the pinch. Your book explores the broader implications of what this might be for, for these companies and for industries moving forward. Um, I guess, can you firstly tell us a little bit about how the book came to be? Well, um, it's, uh, I think it came to be for the right reasons mm -hmm. in the following sense. Um, I got interested in the sharing economy in 2011. And, um, you know, I get interested in things um, periodically. I'm a professor. I study how digital technologies change things. Mm -hmm. Digital technologies are changing lots of different things, yeah. and they attract my attention. Um, but there was something about the sharing economy that really drew me in. Um, I think it was reminiscent to some extent of the industry disruption that I had seen a decade earlier with music and publishing, mm. except that the products weren't digital, they were physical, real-world, everyday things like accommodation and transportation. Yeah. Um, and the other thing was that the, um, the platforms, the, the early-stage companies that I talk to, which um, you know, I do frequently, and pe people in industry who are writing about it and who were thinking about it, um, there's something about the community associated with the sharing economy that was very um, inclusive. Um, they, there was a much greater level of enthusiasm for, you know, let's try and understand, you know, what this means for the world. And, um, you know, there was this, um, I guess, the sentiment of we are changing things for the better. Mm. Yeah, And so, so I ended up spending a lot more time sort of understanding the context than I usually do when I do research. Mm -hmm. And, you know, about, about a year ago, um, someone asked me if I wanted to write a book. And, um, you know, in some sense, I had already done all the research for it. Mm -hmm. And so I just sort of wrote it. And, um, yeah, here we are. Fantastic. So uh, you've, you've talked about this notion of crowd-based capitalism in, in your book, Arun. Uh, can you explain for our audience what you mean by that? Well, um, I use the term crowd-based capitalism to describe what um, most of us label the sharing economy. Mm -hmm. um, I still use the term the sharing economy, as I sort of discuss in the yeah. book, because it uh, maximizes the number of people who know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes. Um, but I, found crowd, I find crowd-based capitalism to be most sort of... Um, that are accurately descriptive of um, the change that we're seeing because it's it's a lot more than people coming up with smart ways of sharing stuff or people coming up with clever business models to tap into underutilized assets. I think it's a sort of early stages of a fundamental shift in how we organize economic activity. You know, I, I, I define crowd-based capitalism as sort of having five characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, one, of course, is the crowd, that is, um, you tap into sort of getting your resources, your labor, your capital, your assets from a distributed group of people rather than, you know, being a company and saying, I'm going to build a bunch of buildings and accommodate people in them, or I'm going to buy a fleet of cars yeah. and rent them out. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, you um, sort of like, you know, you, you end up tapping into capital assets that are being underutilized and therefore increasing their impact. Mm -hmm. um, we shift a lot of activity that used to be company to individual um, away from that model and towards something that more closely resembles a market. And so, you know, Airbnb, for example, mm -hmm. is it's sort of like a hybrid between a firm and a market, right? Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's like a market because anybody can list and they can set their price and positioning and merchandising and customer service. But it's also got the feel of a branded service mm -hmm. experience from a large company. So it's in between. And the two other characteristics that I sort of associate with crowd-based capitalism are blurring of lines. Um, one is a blurring of lines between the personal and the professional. And um, this, is, this, this may be sort of more profound than it seems as a shift. Because um, if you think about it, a lot of the activities associated with the sharing economy, like, you know, sharing your space with someone, mm -hmm. you know, temporarily, uh, giving someone a ride to the airport, um, having someone over for a meal, um, sort of lending someone money to start a business, 
Um, individuals have been doing this for a long time, Correct. and it's sort of fallen under the personal umbrella, right? I mean, you didn't need a special permit before you were able to pick someone up from the airport. Mm -hmm. so, you, know, you didn't sort of check into the latest government regulations before lending <laughs> your apartment to your friend. And so, so there were these things under the personal umbrella. And then you had people who did this kind of stuff full time. You had restauranters, you had taxi drivers, you had bed and breakfasts, you had um, you know, banks. And mm -hmm. what the sharing economy or crowd-based capitalism does is it sort of blurs the lines between personal and professional. Because now these things that were sort of very clearly personal are starting to become commercial. Mm -hmm. You know, you're lending your space, but it's not really lending, you're renting it out, you're getting money, but you're not doing it as a professional accommodation provider, as a professional taxi driver. That's right. And I think that's central to sort of some, of the, some of the regulatory challenges that um, we've hit up against, um, this sort of inability of most city governments to sort of make sense of you know, well, what exactly is this provider? They're not a professional, but, you know, they're commercial. And finally, a blurring of lines between sort of someone who has a full-time job and someone who's sort of just doing stuff in their spare time, mm -hmm. you know, sort of uh, between casual labor and full employment. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and this, this, this sort of has um, implications for what it means to have a job and our work-life balance. Mm, yeah, and no, I think that's an interesting point <laughs> you make there because pretty much every single time I catch a, an Uber, um, the driver has a, a full-time job or a part-time job on the side, or that's his main occupation, and then just does the Uber gig when he has some spare time and wants to just go out, make some cash, and meet some people. So um, definitely is that blurring of the lines there. And um, you know, you're definitely right. You know, we've always shared um, in one way or another, whether it was for commercial uh, intents or, or otherwise. And you know, I still recall being in high school and sharing audio cassettes of, you know, the latest album that came out, and that would get shared yeah. between 20 kids, and everyone would make a copy, and the 20th copy, you would it would be completely uh, unintelligible. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to hear yeah. anything, but you'd still listen to it. But um, it's interesting how, we've, how far we've come since then. But um, <clears throat> on the topic of the profound impact um, that the sharing economy can have on the way we organize um, our economy, essentially. I mean, I recently interviewed Alex Tapscott, who co-wrote The Blockchain Revolution, and he had yeah. some fascinating things to say about how the blockchain may democratize almost everything and, you know, radically increase transparency and, account and, and accountability in otherwise corrupt parts of the world. Um, you know, what's your take on the role that blockchain might play in coming years um, in so far as it relates to disrupting the way we do things? Well, um, I'm, uh, I'm convinced that um, a lot of financial services mm -hmm. and a lot of exchange that involves digital assets mm -hmm. um, is going to be profoundly reshaped by the blockchain. Um, some of this will sort of mirror the sort of like, you know, the, 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 the vision of decentralized, um, you know, organization, mm -hmm. sort of the, the Bitcoin model where there is no central market maker and yeah. sort of the crowd sort of is... Uh, you know, the crowd moves from being the source to being the market. Mm. Um, however, um, I think that um, the process of taking other sort of exchange, other forms of exchange that are more grounded in the physical world um, onto blockchain markets is going to be a fairly slow process. And I, I talk about this at length in one of my book chapters. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, to, to summarize, um, I... I, I, you know, once once you're either providing a real world service, or um, sort of selling a physical product, something that needs to be moved, mm -hmm. um, there are, um, you know, there, there's a bunch of capabilities that the marketplace needs to have. Um, you need to have um, search and discovery capabilities. So you need to have some way of pointing people, sort of, you know, directing people's attention towards the things that they care about. Yep. Um, you need to have logistics capabilities. You need to be able to sort of move stuff around or move the car to where it's supposed to be or like, you know, move the package to where it's sort of like, you know, the person who's bought it. Mm -hmm. And you need to sort of layer in trust of different kinds. Um, you know, especially if it's a peer-to-peer -peer market. And we've seen that sort of as being central to this generation of the sharing economy, where each platform that is successful, whether it's Uber or Airbnb or Blah Blah Car in um, 
in Europe have invested very heavily into, you know, sort of providing trust <clears throat> in, in, you know, getting people to trust each other enough to get into a stranger's car and say, drive me to another city or yeah. you know, sleep in my spare bedroom. The reason why I highlight these three capabilities is that where things stand today, they are still better provided by a centralized intermediary. Mm -hmm. um, we are still in a world where we trust brand, you know, for all of the um, activity around the sharing economy and the, you know, the digital reputations that we've built up and the feedback on Airbnb and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every successful platform realizes that the reality of consumers today is that they trust brands, you know. Yeah. And so um, what, where I'm going with this is that um, I think that blockchain marketplaces for a wide variety of goods and services will emerge. But as they sort of start to get successful, um, new intermediaries that fill the gaps in the trust, the logistics, or the search and discovery um, sort of on those fronts will insert themselves sort of into these blockchain markets and start to sort of capture some of this distributed value creation. Mm, that's an interesting take and, on it. Um, yeah, so, you know, in, in, in some ways, this is what Google did with the web, right? If you think about mm -hmm. the web, which came about 20 years ago, yeah. it's, um, it was the ultimate decentralized content creation platform, right? Mm -hmm. You could publish, and then anybody on the web could, in theory, sort of see it. So it should have democratized publishing completely, mm -hmm. right? Um, but what happened fairly fast was that people couldn't find what they were looking for. Um, they couldn't trust whether this thing that they found was credible or reliable in any way. And so along came the search engine saying that we will help you search and discover, and we will rank and we will sort of direct your attention right. And Google happened to win that um, battle. Mm. But what they're essentially doing is re-aggregating a whole bunch of the distributed value creation that has happened on the web. And so you'll probably see similar things happen in blockchain markets for physical goods and services. Yeah, and um, I guess to that point, um, do you touch on what new, I suppose, jobs or industries um, the sharing economy might create to support um, transactions? For example, you've touched on, at a broader context there, search, logistics, and trust. Um, but what do those three sort of categories lend themselves to in terms of potential um, you know, jobs coming out of this? Well, um, I think that the job creation is going to be of two kinds. Mm -hmm. um, there'll certainly be um, <clears throat> uh, new. There's there's, there's going to be a lot of need for like you know making sure that people can trust the other person at the other the person at the other end of the platform, mm -hmm. and similarly that the person on the other end of the platform is sort of sufficiently you know, is as trustworthy as they want to be. Yeah. And by that, I mean that they've actually got the know-how and the capabilities to sort of maintain their digital profile, mm -hmm. sort of a smart way. They understand how to sort of plug into the marketplace, right? And so on both of those fronts, I see the opportunity for sort of expertise and intermediation yeah. where um, people will say, well, if you've got space, um, I will help you run your Airbnb, and I will make sure that it sort of is a successful business. So you sort of provide the hosting and the space, and mm -hmm. I'll do the rest. Yeah. And we've already seen those kinds of businesses emerge. But what's much more promising is, in some ways, the shift away from us looking for jobs in the first place mm -hmm. and towards um, you know, running a small business as being a significant part of how people make their living. Yeah, yeah, then I, yes, sorry, go on. Oh, no, you, you, you've, got, you've got over 2 million people who host on Airbnb now. Mm -hmm. You've got close to 2 million people who make stuff and sell it on Etsy. You've got, you know, sort of probably approaching a million Uber drivers, millions of Didi Chuxing drivers in China. Mm -hmm. And so these are still small numbers compared to the global job market. But what's happening here is that um, <clears throat> rather than, you know, this, this is in a sense analogous to job creation, except that what's being created is the opportunity to run a micro business. Mm. Yeah. And so, so, you know, um, I'm not claiming that 
these people are like you know not all of those two million people hosting on Airbnb are doing this instead of a full time job. As you pointed out about Uber drivers, um, a lot of them do it to supplement their income. But over time, this you know all of these um, platforms, labor platforms like Airtasker, there is a new generation of labor platforms that are targeted at different professional services. Yeah. Like Universal Avenue for sales, Gigster for like you know if you're a machine learning programmer, mm. um, <clears throat> um, up I'm sorry, um, hourly nerd if you're a consultant, up counsel if you're a lawyer, and so these again will spawn a generation of people who otherwise would have taken a full time job at McKinsey or at a big law firm or like you know at Google, yeah, and who are instead sort of running their own independent micro consulting business and in some sense you know taking control of their destiny and so there's 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 a lot of promising aspects to sort of like the shift in how we organize economic activity because it, it's sort of decentralizing who owns the business. Mm. Yeah, and that's that's a great point. I think I mean m- many people in our audience will obviously. Um, be familiar with companies like Expert 360 here in Australia who essentially are an online consultant marketplace and um, you know when you cut out the overheads of a large firm, the office space, the human capital, the infrastructure and you connect consultants as you've said micro consultancies directly with employers um, everybody wins because the consultants can start, suddenly start making more per hour but the cost to the employer um, is actually less than what they pay to a big firm and they're still arguably getting just as good work out of it. Um, so that's an interesting, um, interesting point to make. But also, I mean, we, we are, as you've correctly alluded to, moving to what people are calling the, the gig economy. Um, you know, is there a risk that we will become generalists um, or that you know, we're heading to, as you've alluded to in your book, a world of empowered and fulfilled entrepreneurs? Well, um, I think that there will be a shift towards generalists. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've, we've already seen that happen. Yep. And um, that's, I guess, two forces in parallel that are causing that. One is, of course, the emergence of platforms that allow us to, you know, for example, run a small short-term accommodation business mm-hmm. without, you know, something that we wouldn't have considered earlier. Um, or like platforms that say, well, you know, you can, you can do all these things. So the sort of access to doing things that you haven't specialized in Mm -hmm. um, is so much easier. And so maybe it's not worth your while to sort of go through the whole process of looking for a job if you're not an expert on something. Yeah. But if you can sort of plug in and out, then you end up sort of doing a broader span of things. But, you know, part of what makes us able to do these additional things is that there's an increasing amount of intelligence embedded into these platforms. Mm-hmm. You know, some of it is, <clears throat> you know, there are all these, it's Airbnb in some ways is almost like sort of a giant franchising business, right? Yeah. It's got all of these capabilities that you sort of just inherit if you plug into the platform. Mm-hmm. And then you have to provide a few other things, but it sort of lowered the barriers to becoming a sort of a short-term accommodation provider, not just because it's made access easier, but it's also given you a bunch of capabilities that you wouldn't have if you were sort of hanging up your own shingle and having to manage the business yourself. Yeah. So, you know, I think as more and more sort of things that used to be done by human beings are embedded into sort of machine intelligence in some sense, Mm -hmm. um, I think that the shift towards generalists will sort of become more and more acute. Yeah. you know, will we be? Will these generalists be empowered entrepreneurs? Um, you know, I hope so. I'm an optimist, mm-hmm. um, but I also think that um, we're going to need government policy that favors the platforms that are creating true entrepreneurs. Mm. You know, um, it's not clear that this kind of empowerment is going to come from something that is simply you know, sort of a conduit for you to tag images or um, label videos. Yeah. You know, I, that, that, that may not be as empowering. And it, you know, it's got to come accompanied by the realization that, you know, in a world where people have full-time jobs, mm-hmm. um, there was a particular funding model for the social safety net, mm-hmm. um, for the paid vacations, income stability, the health benefits, um, yeah. 
you know, a whole bunch, or all of that, and it was typically some combination of the government mandating some of it or providing some of it, mm -hmm. but then the company sort of paying for it, and they, you know, the deal was, the company says, well, you work for me full time, and I will pay you some part of your value as a salary, and I'll spend some other part of it on these things that, you know, we call benefits, mm -hmm. and I'll keep the rest. And, you know, once you break that sort of full-time employment business model, you're also breaking the funding model for the social safety net. Yeah. You know, especially like, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not that acute a problem, say, in Finland, where I was recently, where tax rates are high and the government provides everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's certainly a huge problem in the United States where um, fundamentally the idea of a safety net funding, the, 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 the basic model of funding the safety net here is that the government does very little. Yeah. And the corporation that you work for does most of it. And so, you know, so that's, to me, that's one of the big challenges of the next 20 years to sort of invent a better, a new funding model, one that is well suited for this mm. world in which more and more people are sort of, you know, independent entrepreneurs. Well, that's right. And um, do you have any, any thoughts on what a safety model for the sharing economy might look like, how that might uh, be administered? Well, I, I think that it's going to have to be a partnership. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we can't sort of go to the platforms and say, hey, you pay for this. Mm -hmm. Because the platforms are going to say, listen, you know, the relationship that our providers have with us just isn't the same as the relationship that a full-time employee has with their company. Mm. Um, you could go to the government and say it's time for you to pay for this, but the government's going to say, you know, I don't have the money and I'm going to have to raise taxes a lot. Could go to the individual and say pay for it, but the, you know, individuals and, in, you know, we, we tend to sort of not be great at you know, um, planning for the future yeah. sort of, or to planning for unlikely things, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a whole industry of like insurance that has sort of come up around our inability to sort of put enough money away for things that may not happen or for our retirement. But, you know, a smart government also says, well, let's give people an incentive to do this. So in the United States, if you save towards your retirement, the government gives you a tax break. Mm. And a company will often sort of match what you put in. So you say, okay, I'm going to put in like 200 bucks a month towards my retirement. A yeah. company will say, well, I'll put in an extra 100 and the government gives me a tax break on that $100 as well. Yeah. And so this kind of partnership where the individual contributes, maybe the platform matches some of it and the government gives you a tax break, but not just for retirement, but a whole host of other things, whether it's income stability or vacations or the other parts of the safety net, and where it's sort of prorated based on how much time you're spending with the platform. Yeah, and I think that uh, that approach makes sense. Um, you know, with your four hundred one ks or superannuation here in Australia, um, you know, governments. I mean, I, I know here they they do offer incentives if you're providing more than what the minimum um, statutory amount is is required, um, and therefore. You know, I guess if you've got that incentive, people are more likely to put it away. But again, it comes back to that innate human nature where people may just feel, well, look, I could, you know, invest it into my 401k and maybe I'll get a dollar for dollar up to up to a certain amount, but I'd rather spend it today. Yeah, and so um, I, I think there's a point up to which um, we can have the government sort of um, help you sort of get there. But, mm. you know, I think we're... Um, we've got a long way to go before we're at that point where the real problem is people aren't responding to the government incentives. Mm. Um, we've got to sort of put those incentives in place, place first and also sort of put in place like a marketplace where, you know, if you put the money in this account, then there are things that you can get mm. in exchange for it. Um, like, you know, maybe there'll be a product that says, you know, I will pay you, I'll, 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 I'll study your earnings over the last... 52 months and then I'll send you a paycheck every month mm. and then like you know I'll sort of pick up the difference um, you know for some sort of fee so this is like a reverse insurance product or um, something that says well like you know you join our service and like you know we'll 
sort of help you manage your income in a way that allows you to take two weeks off like you used to when you had a full-time job. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I mean, <laughs> maybe even um, interest-bearing accounts um, for all the different platforms. So you could be an Airbnb host, you have an online account where all of your revenue is stored, and maybe that account earns interest at 3% rather than just sitting there. Who knows? Yeah. Um, so I guess on, on regulation, I mean, you've talked about policy pertaining to safety net, um, and, you know, there's been a lot of outcry from lobbyists, from regulators, uh, different parts of the world, particularly aimed at the likes of Airbnb and Uber. Um, and I guess if you hark back to the early 20th century, um, when the Model T Ford came along, you know, it was not uncommon for the horse-drawn carriage lobbyists to triumph, um, albeit temporarily, in influencing policy that prevented cars from going faster than horses. So, um, you know, what's your take on the role of regulatory bodies when it comes to the, the sharing economy? Well, um, I think that um, regulation remains extremely important even as we move away from sort of industrial capitalism mm -hmm. to cloud-based capitalism. It's just that who's going to be doing the regulation is going to have to change. Yeah, um, We're going to end up Ideally, we should end up with a much larger number of non-governmental agencies who are, or non-governmental actors who are playing a role in sort of regulating safety. Mm. And, or, you know, a part of the reason for that is, um, you know, if you, you know, you, you sort of, um, you know, the, 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 I guess the modern day equivalent of the people with the horse-drawn carriages is the taxi industry, right, where they're, um, you know, there's sort of been a lot of significant pushback from taxi lobbyists about the emergence of Uber and Lyft and these other services. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is that, um, you know, 30 years ago in New York, um, you know, if there wasn't a government regulator for taxis, um, the taxi industry wouldn't have existed. Yeah. You know, you needed some sort of reliable third party to say, this is a legitimate cab, this is how much you're going to be charged, here's sort of a machine to put in there that will sort of make sure that the driver's not ripping you off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm going to make sure that the vehicles are inspected. And you needed that third party, and the only alternative was the government. Yeah. Um, but if you fast forward to today, um, there's a lot of new technology that eliminates the need for regulation of certain things. Like, you know, everybody looks at their GPS and can sort of tell whether the driver is <laughs> taking the wrong route or yeah. not. Um, that same technology can sort of figure out exactly how much you're going to be paid. But more importantly, for some of these other things, like driver screening and vehicle inspections, you have a new third party, which is the platform. Mm -hmm. And so maybe their interests aren't always aligned with societies. But to me, the right model is to say, well, what what should we make Uber and Lyft do? Mm -hmm. And what are the things that we really need the government to step in and manage the market? Because, you know, if the market sort of takes care of itself or we can tell Uber and Lyft or, you know, the, the other ride-sharing companies, listen, we need you to make sure that here are the standards and you have to enforce the rules or, you know, here are the objectives and you come up with your own ways of, like, you know, which may be better. So, mm. you know, if you want to make sure that passengers are safe and you sort of delegate the responsibility for safety to Uber, they may invent some machine learning sort of data-based method of screening drivers that is vastly superior to, yeah. like, fingerprinting them and looking at a government database. But yeah. in order to do that, we need enough trust in these platforms to actually sort of delegate the responsibility. So... You know, I don't think that um, government regulatory agencies are at fault. Um, they used to live in a world where they were necessary, and that necessity has changed. Mm. Um, the platforms are, have legitimate complaints. They've invented a new model, and it doesn't fit into these old regulatory boxes. Mm -hmm. um, so what we really need to do is to sort of rethink and sort of reinvent how we regulate. You know, yeah. we, we don't want to be sort of trying to retrofit the new business models to the old um, sort of forms of regulation. So, you know, you know, if I had to summarize, I'd say we're going to see more rather than less regulation. But what regulation looks like is going to change and who does the regulating is also going to change. Yeah, and um, ultimately what you're saying is in the longer term, I guess we can see the regulators playing more of a 
of a guide, guiding role, um, providing standards, but not so much enforcing this is exactly the way you need to do things, um, bullet point for bullet point. Um, because as you've correctly alluded to, um, it is companies like Uber um, who are probably in a better position to come up with better ways of doing things, you know, uh, using disruptive technology as an enabler to help them cut out some of that regulatory burden. For example, you mentioned the GPS system or the, the ride tracking system, which basically calculates exactly how much you should pay. Um, they're in a much better position to come up with that technology. But again, I guess it comes back to trust um, and also people in this generation at least, um, maybe in 10, 20, 30 years, people will have a different um, opinion of regulators and what role they should play. Um, but I think people still want the regulator to play some role, um, at least today, in um, providing for that uh, level of trust. Uh, absolutely. I think that there's always going to be an oversight role for mm -hmm. the government. I mean, that's that's the point of government, right? I mean, yeah. we, as a society, we've said, well, you know, we're going to create this entity that is responsible for the collective and mm -hmm. is sort of our, um, we're going to give them a monopoly on certain things like violence and so on. But, you know, fundamentally, that's our place of last recourse if um, the markets that we live in aren't functioning right. Yeah. But if they're doing fine by themselves or doing better, then we should sort of let them let them do their thing. But uh, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, um, there's better ways of, of fulfilling some of society's objectives that the platforms will come up with. And, you know, they also have sort of the best enforcement capability, right? I mean, you mm. know, if someone's not compliant, they can just disconnect them from the platform. And, yeah. you know, that, 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 come, that brings with it its own sort of challenges of access and so on. But, but you know, and it's, you know, the, another thing that um, is going to be different, right, goes back to that blurring of lines between personal and professional, mm -hmm. which is that... Um, you know, even, you know, so running a regulatory system that is centralized and sort of government provided and, you know, um, could make sense when you've got like 10,000 cab drivers in Manhattan. Yeah. But if you've got like, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who are plugging in and out of platforms, um, the burden on the government is going to be sort of immense if they have to regulate everybody or if you... You know, if you've got a few thousand restaurants that have to be inspected, that's one thing. But if people are sort of having other people over and sort of having these paid meals in these sort of like online supper clubs, which are getting increasingly popular, mm -hmm. um, we certainly have to rethink how we regulate sort of health and safety for food prepared by other people because the restaurant model isn't going to fit. Yeah, yeah. And I think it, it all comes back to regulation being about what's good for the consumer rather than yep. the industry incumbent, which often seems to be the case. Yeah, well, that, you know, um, it's, it's a natural process by which sort of the dominant person in an industry will capture the regulator to some extent. Mm. And, you know, it's just, you know, I, I, I would expect that in five years there will be someone challenging Uber and complaining that Uber has sort of, you know, shaped the regulations to suit its business model and, yeah. you know, the regulators aren't sort of are sort of favoring Uber in view of this new entrant. And so it's just sort of like, you know, a continuous process. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And Uber is the most powerful uh, ride-sharing company in the world right now. And I guess they have the ear of, of the regulators and can influence it, uh, can influence policy in their best interests. Um, so I, I touched earlier, Arun, on professional services marketplaces, and I guess I just wanted to expand a little bit more on that. I mean, we've, we've seen companies like UpCouncil, um, which is essentially an attorney marketplace, vouched for for accountants and financial advisors, rec recruit loop for recruiters, um, SkillBridge and Expert360, who I mentioned earlier, for consulting. Um, do you have any advice for large um, professional services firms in terms of how they can compete going forward um, in light of these challenges? Well, um, I think that there are two things that... Um you know, um, if I was a large professional services firm that I'd be doing, mm -hmm. the first thing I'd be doing is that I'd be sort of shifting my business away from smaller contracts and towards larger company, you know, sort of larger contracts with larger companies, mm -hmm. because those are unlikely to shift to the platforms anytime soon. Yeah. So if, um, you know, if the federal government sort of has a $10 million contract, they will go to McKinsey. Yeah. You know, that's that sort of, that seems unlikely that they're going to be on, you know, up, 
up on um, our Leonard or um, like on Expert 360, yep. sort of trying to sort of piece this together. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but what they should also do is to um, think of these uh, platforms as um, recruiting hubs because, um, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of people who try them out, mm -hmm. who try out this life of wanting to sort of be a provider in like, you know, the sharing economy. And some people are going to say, well, maybe I can make more money by doing this, but I kind of like the idea of a stable paycheck. You yeah. Know? And there's something empowering about having the same amount of money every month. Yeah. And, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> and so, you know, there, there will be the opportunity for them to sort of, um, you know, perhaps sort of attract some of the people who try these platforms out. So think of them as a sort of a talent screening service mm -hmm. but realize that a lot of your business is going to go to them and so focus on the places where you have you know where the you know the branded professional service provision is a big part of the product yeah and because uh, those are unlikely to sort of tip anytime soon mm. so you don't think that uh, large professional services firms need to rethink um, their cost structure um, if if the uh, online marketplaces were to take off and command a bigger piece of market share at that lower sort of cost per hour? Um, well, they'll probably need to rethink their sort of employment footprint. Mm -hmm. um, and But I think it's more a question of going after the business where their cost structure makes sense. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, as opposed, because, you know, they could certainly bring the marketplace into the company and sort of like maybe use it to some extent to manage their talent more efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, but fundamentally, um, what they want to be doing is saying, well, we have a cost structure that is never going to be as sort of, you know, favorable as Expert 360. Yeah. But so we're going to go after the business where people are willing to pay a premium for the brand and the sort of, um, you know, the expertise branding that sort of comes with being associated with a large firm as opposed to sort of an independent consultant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, make, that makes perfect sense. And I also like what you mentioned there on um, uh, using underutilized uh, staff more efficiently. Um, I know KPMG um, published a platform called Marketplace last year where um, underutilized staff could be hired out um, for a cheaper rate by almost any company um, for short-term gigs, um, which obviously I, I think for the employee it's great because they're not sitting on the bench doing nothing and just completing proposals. They're actually out there working, building relationships, um, generating some income for the firm as well, um, and also improving their own morale, um, which is critically important, I think, especially for those junior consultants coming up the ranks in places like KPMG. So maybe it's um, a, matter, a bit of a balancing act and, you know, you can enjoy the fruits of these marketplaces while still looking for your niche in the market, as you've, as you've correctly alluded to there, the people that are willing to pay a premium. Yep. Um, okay, Arun, I wanted to, to close out with a few questions that I ask all of my guests. So this is basically a bit of fun, totally unscripted. Um, question, question number one would be, if you could work for any company at any stage of their company lifecycle, who would it be and why? Well, um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a boring answer to this question, which is, um, you, know, I, um, you know, I would probably still work for Edvayu. Um, mm -hmm. I... You know, I, I really love my job. Yep. And uh, but you know, 15 years ago, if you had asked me this question, um, I would have probably said that um, you know I would um, you know really have wanted to work for um, you know a, a a research lab in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. You know, like a federal research lab in the 1950s. I think that they were sort of really incredibly exciting places. Yeah. Um... I'm, I'm getting the feeling that this is going to be one of those answers that is edited out. No, no, no. It's sort of <laughs> boring. No, no, look, I think it's, it's somewhat refreshing that you've actually um, called out your current place of employment as a place you'd want to um, work. I think that's, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's what everyone's answer would, everyone would like to have that answer, so that's great. Um, so question number two is, um, if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Um, well, I would probably ask, um, well, this is a, 
That's okay. We can, we, we can always edit out how yeah. long it takes you to respond and make it sound as if it took you one second. <laughs> well, I, I, I would probably ask um, the uh, sort of like, you know, the, the, the historical Indian sort of uh, political leader, Gandhi. Mm -hmm. um, I would ask him, like, you know, where he got his confidence that um, his model of civil disobedience would actually work because... I think mm. the the gap between concept and reality there is um, sort of perhaps the furthest that I've seen in anything that actually succeeded. It, you know, it was sort of a an early form of sort of crowd-based power, yeah. right? And he said, "I will not use a centralized thing. I will provide the platform, and then the decentralized crowd will actually execute." And he had this confidence that it would actually work. Yeah. And it, it runs so completely counter to logic and to human sort of self-preservation. So I would ask him where he sort of got the inspiration and the confidence that his idea of civil disobedience would work at scale. Because mm, he yeah. essentially came up with this concept at a time when the Indian population were incredibly subservient to the, to the English, from what I understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and, and where the education levels were pretty low, and um, so yeah, it, it 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 took it took sort of a vision that I haven't really seen a parallel of in any other sphere. So mm, well, that's a great answer. And finally, everyone, I ask all my questions, all my guests, a question on lifestyle design. Um, people who are out there doing great things, writing <coughs> books, giving keynotes, um, all sorts of stuff. How do you stay on top of your game? Do you have any rituals or routines that you partake in on a daily basis? Well, um, I try to make sure that if I am in New York, um, I spend a couple of hours every day with my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it, you know, this could be taking her to school, it could be um, making her dinner, it could be sort of hanging out and having fun. But um, you know, I find that, that that sort of grounds me. Yeah. It um, it sort of achieves the balance that I want, but you know I've, I've I've tried a whole bunch of other sort of you know um, rituals, but this seems to be the one that works for me. That sort of keeps me productive and keeps me grounded. Yeah, yeah. Relationships are incredibly important. So, Arun, where can people go to find out a little bit more about you and your work? Well, um, you know, you can follow me on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, my handle is digital Arun, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and if you go to my Twitter account, you will find my website. Um, I post a lot of things that, um, you know, sort of, you know, are current when I'm speaking, you know, what I'm writing about. Yeah. Um, you'll also notice that my website looks like it was built in the 1990s because uh, <laughs> I used to actually build websites in the 1990s. Yeah. And I haven't sort of, I haven't, um, I haven't updated my HTML skills <laughs> or high. So, you know, you'll find a sort of a circa 1995 looking website that yep. is built by me. So Fantastic. Yeah, I remember those GeoCities websites with the um, animated GIFs. They were, they, they were a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for, for giving up some time today, Arun. You've been a wonderful guest and um, you enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thanks, Steve. I really enjoyed the conversation and, um, you know, hope, 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 your, you, hope your listeners find it interesting. I'm sure they will. Cheers. Well, that's it for my chat with Arun. He's definitely left us with a lot of food for thought pertaining to the sharing economy and the implications it has on a broad cross-section of our industries. So um, if you'd like to find out a little bit more about Arun and all the stuff he's working on, you can head to uh, Twitter and find him at Digital Arun. If you're picking up what we're putting down here at Future Squared, um, we'd really appreciate if you took just a moment of your time to get onto iTunes, SoundCloud or Stitcher and either like, share or subscribe to this podcast or do all three. Um, if you'd like to find out a little bit more about Collective Campus, the innovation school and consultancy that brings you this podcast, just head to collectivecamp.us. Until next time, Future Squared out.